Hello guys and welcome here to another edition of Out of Turn 4 and today we're actually on the right time frame as opposed to the last week where we kind of had to do our episode um, on a Friday afternoon. So we're back on time. Um, of course you may notice, sorry I don't have a racing shirt today. I was way too impressed with my team's effort yesterday. I'll disclose uh, or I'll talk about the rest of that on uh, Tinkle Sports Talk on Sunday. So, anyway, coming up on the show today, we're going to mostly talk some IndyCar today as the IndyCar season wrapped up at Long Beach. So we're going to start off with that. We're going to recap NASCAR at Vegas. we got a lot of silly season news in IndyCar to get to, possibly my predictions, but of course we'll see. It's dependent on time um, as far as where everyone will go for next season then of course my weekend predictions for the race weekend at Talladega but we start off with the IndyCar series at Long Beach uh, Colton Herta another dominating performance man you gotta imagine that if he didn't blow a couple of those races earlier in the year he would be the one in the thick of this battle right now but unfortunately his inconsistency costed him a chance at the championship but I assure you he will be in the championship hunt possibly next year. That I can see happening. But he pulls off a win before the season ends at Long Beach. And of course, um, you know, I believe it, that's his third win of the season if I'm not mistaken. Um, so congratulations to Colton Herta. But in bigger news, of course, we talk so much about a sophomore slump. This guy didn't get a sophomore slump. This guy, if this is sophomore slump, let me tell you, if I was a second-year IndyCar driver, I think I'd be extremely happy with this. Alex Pillow is your 2021 IndyCar Series champion. Of course, this is back-to-back -back championships for Chip Ganassi Racing. And again, Alex Pillow's second season, and he won a championship. I think this shows just how much Chip Ganassi believed in him, as well as the fact of how good of a driver he really is. So congratulations to Alex Pillow. I gotta tell you, I expected him to have a great year at Chip Ganassi. I expected maybe a win, two wins. I didn't expect him to go out and win a championship, so he shattered my expectations, of course. I thought this was going to be another New Garden and uh, Dixon battle. So, congratulations again to uh, Alex Pillow. Hell of a job this year. I mean, he's fought some adversity, but he overcame that at the end of the day to win his first championship, and that's just something special right there. Um, of course, speaking of the championship, there was one guy who really was the only guy that could catch um, Alex Pillow, and that guy was Pato Award. Now, he was knocked out early in a wreck with Ed Jones. Um, he managed to continue after fixing the damage, but unfortunately, um, the car kind of just died from there. Some, I believe one of the axles broke or something took him right out of the race and it was just unfortunate for uh Pato Ward you know he's had a hell of a year just like Alex Palo has but honestly Pato was a little more consistent than Alex was in the latter stretch so you gotta feel for Pato he will be a champion one day in IndyCar it just wasn't meant to be this year unfortunately and of course that incident begs the question, should Ed Jones have been penalized? To be honest, I've only seen the replay once. So, based on what I saw, I believe yes, he should be. Because it looks like it was avoidable contact. It looks like he dove into the corner. Kind of just went full send. But again, I really haven't seen many replays. I really didn't even get a chance to watch the race because I was at work all day. Um, so, again, um, possibly should have been penalized. That's just what I'm going to say uh, as far as that goes. Uh, my overall thoughts on the season, to be honest, my takeaway is this is the best IndyCar season we've seen in a while, despite how bad the schedule was. Um, 
you know, I feel like the competition was a lot closer this year than it's been in the last few because the last few, I mean, Andretti, Penske, you know, they were untouchable. You know, there was no Errol McLaren, Schmidt, Peterson in the running. You know, Meyer Schenk was never in the running. Um, Andretti was a fringe candidate, and then you'd get the one surprise win a year. Um, but this year, I mean, you saw Meyer Shank racing win the Indy 500. You saw Pato Award competing for wins week in and week out. And really, you know, you saw Penske struggle to open the season. That's something you never see out of Team Penske. I mean, it was just a rare sight. I mean, it's normal to see that out of Will Power because Will Power lately hasn't been on his game, I think is fair to say. I mean, he always comes out with a win, but he really hasn't been championship goal power in a little while. Um, you know, Simon Paginaud really hasn't been in it. I mean, you know, to be honest, for you know, last year it was all it was all Scott Dixon from start to finish. There was no one really else that challenged him. So. At the end of the day, that's where I think the competition's gotten closer, and I think that's a thumbs up to IndyCar showing how well of a job they're doing in terms of the competition gap. And I wish this is something I could see out of F1, because if I saw this in F1, I'm not going to lie, I might actually watch it. But because that competition gap is so far, I'll never watch F1. Um, but that begs the question, is this the end of the alternative years where it's either Newgarden or Dixon coming out with the championship? I think that question is going to wait till next year, but for the time being, yes, I, I would say this is the end of it. Obviously, just because Polo won, but at the same time, you know, again, Pato was competitive. Elio won the 500, and Elio is showing that he may be older, but he's still got a shot. And, you know, Colton Hurt is coming into his own. I mean, late in the year, and he came alive at the wrong time. I mean, yeah, he won Laguna Seca. He won Long Beach. So he came into his own later in the year, but really, if he had kept up that consistency all year in those races where he wrecked out, Maybe, just maybe, he would have won a championship out of it. So, again, I think, you know, the competition gap's a little closer. But we'll wait and see what happens next year in terms of the championship battle. NASCAR at Las Vegas. Real quick, we'll take a break. Talk NASCAR. Um, Christian Eckes, the surprise winner in the truck series. And really, the truck in Xfinity had some surprises. Um, so, uh, Todd Gillen dominated the race late, or throughout the race, rather, and then, of course, Christian Eckes gets around with help from his teammates, and he really didn't look back. So, at the end of the day, Christian Eckes gets his first win, and to be honest, that's a huge middle finger to Kyle Busch Motorsports, who let him go. Keep in mind, that Toyota program cut throat. And I think he showed right there that if Kyle Busch gave him another year, he would have won some races. Um, you know, I'm happy for him, honestly. I think Eckes is a talented driver. He just needs a good shot, honestly. You know, but also the big news of that race. We have our first ever Truck Series Team 1, 2, 3, 4 in the history of the Truck Series. And that now belongs to Thor Sport Racing. Um, so congratulations to that whole team. They really came came on late in that race. Um, my thoughts on the race, it was bizarre. I mean, I was watching it on my phone and whatnot. You know, I was watching it late at night on my phone, and I just couldn't believe the wrecks that occurred in that race. You know, it was just insane, honestly. The, later sta the latter stages were just insane. So I think it was a good Vegas race for once. A little wild for my liking, but great. Um, NASCAR Xfinity Series, uh, Josh Berry is the winner. 
at Las Vegas. It is his second win of the season. Keep in mind, he won earlier in the season in a scheduled entry, driving the number eight for Junior Motorsports. And now his second win coming in a relief role. He fills in for Michael and Nett um, there. Of course, Michael Annette has had a lingering leg issue for the better part of the last few months. Um, man, if Josh Berry didn't miss race, you know, if he really ran the full season. This guy probably would be in the championship battle. He would be deep in the round of eight. That much I will say. So congratulations to Josh Berry. Um, personally, the other thing I take away from this is he's the guy who should be driving the one car. You know, look, I get Mike Lynette brings great sponsorship aboard, but no, you guys need to have Josh Berry in the car. I'm sorry. Like, I'm putting in my endorsement for Josh Berry to drive that car. Um, Junior Motorsports, they get a 1-2-3 finish. Of course, Allgaier's second, Gregson finished in third, so great day for Junior Motorsports and really a good weekend for them. Um, you know, again, that race a little bit bizarre as well, but, you know, glad to see another guy who deserved to get the win out of this. Um, anyway, on to the cup race at Las Vegas. Denny Hamlin is the winner yet again. In another playoff opening or opening round race. Um, it is his second win of the year. He advances to the round of eight. But of course the big news before the race was an interview with Kevin Harvick. Who had said that talking to Chase Elliott in the hauler at the end of the cup race. Was like talking to his nine year old at the racetrack. Um. And that begs the question, is this battle over? And I'm just going to say not by any stretch. Not by any stretch. My apologies there. Um, you know, is Harvick playing head games? He absolutely is. He's trying to get in Chase head, or Chase's head. Um, needless to say, I don't think this battle is over. Maybe it'll be psychological warfare. Maybe it's going to be another wreck on track. But some tells me this isn't over. So, needless to say, this is going to be something to watch as the rounds go on, especially as we enter Talladega and the Charlotte Roval. Now on to some silly season news. And this is a big one. Um, Simon Paginot announced today, he or yesterday, he will be leaving Team Penske. And he will be leaving the team to join Meyer Shank Racing and team up with his former Team Penske teammate, Elio Castroneves, over there. Um, big news there. And I got to say, this one didn't shock me, to say the least. It really didn't. But I guess read, I was reading an article from ABC News. And the more I read it, the more I'm like, man, maybe this, you know, this is kind of shocking if this is the reason why. So, again, um, you know, I think it's good for Paginot. I think it's good for Meyer and Shank Racing. You know, they've needed some veteran presence. And to have uh, Simon and Elio, two of the Penske guys over there, they bring, a, you know... They bring a good culture over there, and I think it will certainly help out Meyer and Shank grow their race team, you know, whereas I think Harvey, for a lack of a better way to put it, Harvey was holding him back, I think, at the end of the day. So, we'll see what happens here. Um, this also begs the question, because this is now the second driver across all platforms that has left Team Penske for another opportunity in their respective sport. Of course, um, Brad Keselowski was the other one. He left to join Roush Fenway Racing, driving the number six and being the co-owner of the team. So, is the Penske way no longer as good as it's made out to be? Is the big question here. Big, big question here. 
and it sure seems that, I, I don't think so but I think it sure seems that way and it's very easy to say that it is like that just from the standpoint of you know again they lost two drivers it's very rare that drivers leave team Penske under their own power you know like in their own will you know because team Penske if you're there you stay there for years because you know that's your best chance of winning and maybe it was sim you know for me maybe it's Simon Pagano said I've accomplished everything I can accomplish here um, I think the ABC News article I read had said he was kind of in fear of having to go, you know, he was in fear of being put out to pasture like Elio Castroneves. Um, you know, so I guess it's not, you know, the more I read it, I guess it's not surprising. Although I thought if any driver there was going to be put out to pasture, it was going to be Will Power. I'm just going to be honest there. I thought it should have been him just based on the last few years alone so but again I guess I see why um, now Brad Keselowski though that's a totally different scenario because he really wasn't in danger being put out to pasture okay he's a champion Roger Penske knows that he's a NASCAR champion and he's a proven winner at the end of the day and he leaves because he doesn't or he wanted an ownership stake because he knows he's in his late 30s, you know. He's coming close to, in a way, the retirement age. Unless you're Kevin Harvick, then you're just ageless. But, you know, I think he knew there, hey, I'm coming up to the end of my NASCAR career. I want to have a career beyond my career. And this ultimately seemed like his best way to achieve that. So, at the end of the day, his made sense, but... Pagano, you know, I think his was more a way just to stay in IndyCar. And I think he knew with Team Penske coming back into IMSA competition that if he had another kind of so-so year or bad year, that he was going to be the one put out to pasture in uh, IMSA and eventually just be released from the team in general. I mean, I think he thought, you know, about a lot about Elio and Montoya and just knew what was coming. So I don't think it has as much to say about the Penske way. I think it's just a matter of two different scenarios and two totally different ones. And just essentially both drivers looking out for their best interests. Um, of course, this is a story. This next story is one that we have talked about on the show, but now it is official. Um, Roman Grosjean will run the full NASCAR, or er, I'm sorry, the full NTT IndyCar schedule starting next season um, with Andretti Autosport and D DHL in the 28 car will be his ride. Um, you know, I think this is good for Roman. I think he was very competitive over at. Um, I think he was competitive over at Coin and uh, Rick Ware, but I think Andretti is the next step forward. You know, could he be one to have a polo type season? That's a possibility, honestly. I think that's a huge possibility that he could be in a Alex Polo type situation. Of course, he's going to have to learn the ovals. That's going to be a bit of a struggle, but you keep in mind he's only got four or five ovals he has to race all year because he's only got texas a shit show oval he's got indianapolis you know big prestigious race and he's got a month to test for that one then he's got the double header at iowa two races there and he's got gateway next year and he's already run gateway so two of those ovals he will be well prepared for at the end of the day. And I think without without question, he's going to have probably the help of um, Fernando Alonso. You know, maybe Alonso will help him out a little bit from overseas. You never know. Um, so 
at the end of the day, I think it's good, and I think it says a lot about where his IndyCar career is, or where he wants to race long term, because, you know, there were questions, maybe he goes back to F1, and I think he knows that here in America, here in IndyCar, he has his best chance to be competitive, and certainly with the t- with two teammates like uh, Herda and Herda and Rossi, he's going to learn a lot under them. He is going to learn a lot, and he's going to be really in a good situation over there. So I think this was his best case situation, and I think without a doubt he can compete for this championship next year. Um, another one I think will be joining them. It's a possibility. Kyle Kirkwood, of course, he is the Indy Lights champion, so he will for sure be running at least a couple IndyCar races next year, and one of them is guaranteed to be the Indy 500, as rules with the uh, scholarship go, since he has scholarship money for next season. I imagine he will drive for them next year, but of course we'll talk about that, hopefully in a couple minutes. Uh, Renus VK is going to or he's going to stay put there were rumors he was going to go to team Penske and replace Simon Paginot it is not going to happen he will stay with Ed Carpenter Racing for next year I think that's good because he's still got a little bit more to work on he's in a good situation there so I think he's in a position where he can win some races over there maybe not as much as he would have if he went to Penske but at the end of the day I'm happy to see VK stay put. Um, Anyway, we have a little bit of time, so I'll quickly go through my IndyCar Silly Season predictions. Of course, the first one involves the latest rumor out of AJ Foyt Racing that they will be likely expanding into a three-car operation. Um, With that, obviously, I believe Dalton Kellett will be back. I think I've heard he's already confirmed to be back. Um, It sounds like A.J. Foyt Racing wants Sebastian Bourdais back, as he is a big, he's a big part of their rebuild. So, again, he might be back as well, but he is not confirmed yet, whereas uh, Kellett is most likely confirmed. And, of course, then I believe... We will have the third driver, and this is going to be an interesting entry into the Rookie of the Year race. I think Tatiana Calderon will be their third driver, as opposed to Charlie Kimball, who will probably be the Indy 500 driver. So again, I'm going to say Tatiana Calderon. She will drive the third AJ Foyt car in 2022, full-time with Roket as the sponsor of the team. So, that's my prediction again. She's already tested for the team. Roket likes her. And, of course, um, Tatiana, I think, impressed in her test session. So, that's another reason for why I think she'll be there. Um, Takuma Sato, he's going to the 18 to drive for Coin Vassar Sullivan. Um, I just think, you know, again, we talked about it, I think, last week or the week before, He's, he was rumored to go there. It sounds like he's going to. If it's not him, maybe it's Ryan hunter Ray. Um, I think one of those two for sure will end up in the Vassar-Sullivan ride with Dale Coyne Racing. Um, now as far as Ray Hall, Letterman, Lanigan. Because Sato will be likely leaving the organization, it sounds like it's going to happen. Um, Jack Harvey, I think, has already been all but confirmed to drive the number 30 to replace Takuma Sato. And then I believe Santino Ferrucci will be the driver of the third car. Now I know Oliver Askew has been in the talks lately. He's run the last three races for him. I know that um, Christian Lungard ran at Indy. I think he's definitely the second candidate for that ride. But ultimately Ferrucci showed one thing, that he's matured a lot. And I think he's shown that he is the guy that can really run well for them. And I think he's shown that he can put up consistent results. So he, I believe, would be the best case situation for Ray Hall Letterman Lanigan Racing as opposed to Christian Lungard and Oliver Askew. Um, Again, I'm going to go back to Kyle Kirkwood as mentioned. I think Kyle Kirkwood will drive the Andretti uh, Andretti Har- uh, I'm sorry, Andretti Harding Steinbrenner 
entry for 2022. Um, whereas his um, rival, his Indy Lights rival, David Malukas, maybe he goes to that coin wear seat. I think that's a possibility. If not him, maybe Kevin Magnuson. Um, now I know Magnuson is running currently in IMSA with Chip Ganassi Racing. I don't imagine he will run an IndyCar for Chip Ganassi Racing. I think that's a bit of a stretch. But I think Magnuson would be a good candidate for that 51 car. Um, one thing Foyt likes to do is he likes to pick random guys to drive the second ride. He likes to pick guys that are new to the series. So, again, I think he will be in the running, maybe with Coin Ware in the 51, as with Malukas, who really doesn't have the scholarship money. So, again, Malukas doesn't have the scholarship money. Kirkwood does, so that's why I think Kirkwood's going to end up in a ride more than likely in Dreddy Harding Steinbrenner. Um, Malukas, he could also be the road course expert for um, Ed Carpenter Racing. That is also a possibility. But um, Magnuson, I think, is a bit of a stretch. We'll have to wait and see, of course. Um, and, of course, if Malukas ends up at Coinware or Magnuson, they will have backing from Nurtek, so that would be huge for that team. Um, I think uh, Christian Lungard will be in the paddock at some point this season. Um, I don't know if it'll be full-time. I don't know if it'll be with Ray Hall. Maybe it's with ECR as the road course guy. I don't know. Again, so much is up in the air with Ed Carpenter racing in that 20 car because of sponsorship and funding with Connor Daly. So I think a lot of that will revolve on that, and we will see what happens in the coming weeks and months in terms of the IndyCar offseason. But those are my predictions for that. Let's get on to the weekend predictions, starting with the Truck Series at Talladega. I'm going to predict Sheldon Creed. He took a hard crash at Las Vegas. Glad, glad to hear he's okay. Um, but I think he will bounce back with a win and advance himself into the championship four. NASCAR Xfinity Series at Talladega. Justin Haley is my prediction. He is so strong on these uh, super speedway races. I think that'll prove no different here. And same in the Cup Series, whereas I'm going to pick Ryan Blaney. He's been strong at Talladega the last few years. And Ford's been strong at Talladega. If it's not him, maybe it's Kevin Harvick, but I think one of those two will end up in victory lane when it's all said and done at Talladega. So those are my predictions for the upcoming weekend. We want to thank you for watching. Um, be sure to like or dislike. Give me your thoughts on what you heard today, and we hope to see you, if not next to or hopefully before next Tuesday, we will see you on Tinkle Sports Talk. Again, we'll be back Sunday at 9 a.m., um, no final bell tomorrow. Um, be sure to tune in for that. Otherwise, we will see you back here next Tuesday with another edition of Out of Turn 4. Until then, guys, goodbye, everyone.